I entitled this sermon, Bless the Lord, Bless the Lord, this, this concept of worshiping and praising God. And you're probably familiar with Romans chapter 12, verse 1, a popular and wonderful verse from Scripture that states very clearly that we are to offer up our bodies, offer up our lives as living sacrifices. That's the worship that we give. It is everything we have. But we know many are led to think that worship that we offer to God is simply sing some psalms like we just did. It's once a week. And while worship includes what we just did, worship includes the singing of songs and praise to God as a church, worship, worship as we know from the Word of God, is expanded to all of our life that we live before God. And Jesus called us to live full lives of worship when he summarized the fulfillment of the law as loving God with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength. Similarly, we could say that Paul said we are called to 24-7 worship of God when he said we are to do all for the glory of God, even if it's eating and drinking. And so this is a distinguishable mark of a Christian. If you are a Christian, your life, not your, your compartments, your life is very much wrapped up in this pursuit, one of worshiping God. Our aim is to worship God in every interaction that we have in all of our ways. And hopefully that is your personal commitment this morning. You would say yes and amen to that. You know what you signed up for, and that is what you are after. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Living in all things to the glory of God. Choosing to worship. However, in order to be most effective in our worship of God, we must ask why. Why do we worship God? And it could be sufficient to answer that. God has told us to. So do it. God told us to do this, and so we do it. We worship Him. However, God has given us more than a cold and meaningless command to worship Him with our lives. God has shown us His amazing character and stunning works and creation and, and salvation and even everything He's unfolded before us in the Word of God and Revelation, the Bible itself. And it's due to these qualities that we, can, we cannot help but worship God. So our worship of God from singing in church to living Christ-like at work must be necessarily focused on God and not ourselves. God, His character, His ways must be the object of our worship. And if we think about this for a moment, you might say, of course, that makes sense. You're worshiping God, not yourself. But this, if you just pause and look around for a moment and consider where you live and the time you live in, this does fly in the face, what we've just said, flies in the face of many churches where we live. It's an actually a controversial position to take how many professing Christians actually think about worship today. Many today view worship as a time in church where they experience God. And thus, many are looking for an emotional encounter with God. And if they've been moved, then that is worship. If they were not moved emotionally, then it couldn't have been worship. And that's how people limit it. They want to feel something and experience something that they've never felt before. And so many attend different churches, and they assess the quality of the church based upon how the music made them feel. And consequently, what do churches do, knowing that this is what people are looking for? Churches go right after it themselves, and they go out of their way to try and produce a type of music and a type of experience that gives people that special feeling. Individuals and churches alike take the plunge, and they put the worshiper's emotion as the highest aim and goal in the worship service. And it's led to lopsided and upside-down worship services in many churches. Rather than focusing on reading God's Word and praying God's Word and singing God's Word and preaching God's Word, many churches put the highest priority on producing an event. An event that gets the most amount of people feeling something emotional for the one hour that they get them each week. And to prove such lopsided and upside-down worship services do in fact exist, and I'm not just saying it, consider the trends of today's popular churches. Music dominates the church service to heighten the emotion. Song lyrics are carelessly emotional and self-centered rather than God-centered. The preaching of God's word has been shortened to release some self-esteem self -esteem kind of TED Talks. The content of preaching has drifted from the word and attempted to capitalize on such themes as Barbie the movie or Super Mario Brothers or whatever hit movie has recently come out. And with such changes to church worship services, we have to we must be forced to answer the question, who is really being worshipped in those churches? <coughs> who, who, who is actually the object of that worship? 
If God is being removed gradually more and more from the service, then it cannot be stated with confidence that he's actually being worshipped. Might be flipped around and say, the people are. They're worshipping themselves because they're worshipping what they want and what they want to feel. And so what can be done to prevent from such drifting? What does true worship look like? How can we make certain that we are actually worshipping God in our lives and our church services? We must keep his character and his ways before us. That's simple. It must be about God. We must be diligent to make it all about him, not us. When we are meditating on the excellencies of our great God, we will be driven to truly worship him and not ourselves. When we are reflecting on all of his incredible works and ways, we will be eager to sing to him and praise him with our lives. As an example for worship, we have the privilege this morning of studying a song from Scripture. We get to study a song straight from the Word of God. And the song is known as the Song of Deborah as it follows on the heels of, of Israel's battle against Sisera, Jabin, and the Canaanites. The Judges 4 gave us the narrative of the story, if you recall. The Canaanites were ruling the Israelites in the north by the Sea of Galilee for 20 years. And God raised up Deborah, a prophetess and judge for Israel at that time. And what did she do? Under God's power and inspiration, she raised up and called out Barak. Barak to assemble an army and to attack Sisera, the commander of 900 chariots in the north. And so Barak responded, and he assembled 10,000 men, and he attacked Sisera with the prompting of Deborah. And God graciously gave Barak's army the victory over the Canaanite army. However, if you recall, the story zoomed in on that dramatic ending with Sisera, the Canaanite commander. He fled the battle and attempted to hide in the tent of Jael, the woman. And while Sisera slept in the tent, Jael killed Sisera with a hammer and a tent peg. And after the Israelite victory over Sisera and his chariots, God granted further victory over the rest of the Canaanites and King Jabin himself. And so after seeing God's mighty ways, and after seeing firsthand God's acts of deliverance for Israel, we come to a proper and worshipful response, the song. Of Judges 5. And we're going to divide the song into three sections as we understand true worship of God modeled for us in his word. So first let's examine the summons to sing in verses 1 through 11. The summons to sing in verses 1 through 11. The summons to sing and we will begin in Judges 5 verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak the son of Abinom on that day that the leaders took the lead in Israel that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned, and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way, to the sound of musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. This is the beginning of the song, the first section here. This is the summons to sing, as I, as I mentioned, and we're going to work through this. First, notice the composers of the song in verse 1. The composers of the song very simply are not just Deborah, but Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. And so as it goes on, it appears that this is about that day, that victory that they had. On that day when they actually went against Sisera and all the iron chariots, and they saw the battle won by God. On that day, then came this worshipful song and response. Now, while it is Deborah and Barak, it does seem to favor Deborah more because verse 7, as we already read, seems to show her even in the first person. Verse 7 again said, The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. And so, related to this victory, related to this moment that we just studied in Judges 4, we have 
a song that comes. Now second, notice the central message of the song. The central message of the song isn't too complicated because it has to really rally around things that are repeated. So verse 2 and verse 9, if you look at both of those real quick, look at verse 2 and verse 9. And what you'll find is they are very similar, very similar verses, and that's not a coincidence. That is intentional. Verse 2, that the leaders took lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Jump to verse 9. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people, bless the Lord. So you have a highlight there. The message is found multiple times in the song, but it's like a mirror in verse 2 and verse 9. Then notice how both verses call attention to three items. First, that the leaders or the commanders took lead and they went out for Israel. Second, that the people offered themselves willingly to fight. And then third, the ultimate point of the song and this moment is to bless the Lord. The ultimate point, the all the glory, all the worship that ought to be given in a moment like this is clearly to Yahweh. It's to God. It's to the God of Israel, the one true God. This song is a song of glory to God for the victory in Israel. Yahweh, Israel's God, is mentioned 14 times in the song. 14 times you see that probably capitalized L-O-R-D, or if you have the LSB, it's Yahweh, 14 times in the song. And you might say, it's a picture of danger and a picture of hopelessness. Notice that the highways are abandoned. Why? Why are people not traveling on the highways? Because it's a time where they're under Canaanite domination. And what's happening? They're getting robbed. There's thieves that abound. And so they can't even travel on the normal roads anymore. They have to take the, the, the back ways and the alleyways. They have, to, they have to take the side streets, so to speak. If villagers cease in Israel, why, why would villagers cease in Israel? Because they're the ones that live in towns that don't have walls. And so when you're just trying to live in a normal settlement without walls, good luck. All it takes is one military raiding party to come by and you're done. And so villagers cease. They have to retreat from those simple towns that they have. And then as is stated, was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 even in Israel? I mean, that's a depressing thought, because if you come to the book of Numbers, and that's where you get a, a true numbering of the, the fighting men in Israel. The fighting men in Israel, after they wandered the wilderness for 40 years, those men that were 20 years old and upward, how many were there? 600,000. 600,000. That's a force, right? That's an army. And here we have a condition in Israel in which I don't think you can even get 40,000 with a spear. I don't even think you can get that. In the midst of this time, though, God raises up Deborah to be a prophetess and judge. She describes herself as a mother in Israel, and as a result, the new leaders were chosen, according to verse 8. And this is not to say that they were falling into new gods. It's a weird phrase, or the, the Hebrew can go either way, but I think other translations have it better than the ESV, that say, actually, at this time, when finally God was raising up people like Deborah and other judges, finally there was a, an understanding and there was a turning of people's hearts. They were... They were actually following new leaders like Deborah and Barak. And as a result, Israel was ready and willing to do battle. Prior to Deborah, it was a sad time for the people of Israel. All right, so what are we to learn from worship after seeing this initial summons to sing? And we, we get it. There's been a victory and there's been a, a summons for everyone to hear this and everyone to engage in this and everyone to know about it. But what do we learn? First, to be clear, it is Yahweh and, and Yahweh alone who deserves the glory in our worship. He's the one who shows up, as he did for Israel. He's the one who works powerfully for his people. He's the one that we must bless, as it said two times, bless the Lord. Even though leaders and people made themselves willing to fight in Israel, Deborah and Barak are, are clear to state, bless the Lord. Any strength, any power or boldness God's people have to do as well is a testimony to God working in his people. We understand this. Any moment where, where the people of God rise up and act in faith, we say, praise the Lord. We don't say, praise the Israelites. Oh, so glad they did it. We say, praise the Lord. That was God working in and through them. God working in and through his people to actually rise up and do what was right. Second, all people must know about our God through worship. All people must know. This is a summons for not just us to know this, but for everyone to hear this. Everyone needs to know about this God. This isn't something you keep to yourself. This isn't a quiet little small God that just wants to sit in your little heart. This is the God of the universe and the God beyond the borders of Israel. He needs to be known. His name needs to be declared and proclaimed among the nations. Everyone needs to know about this great God. Do you believe what he's done? How he delivers? How he's a saving God? None should be left out from hearing of God's good works. And this is how we encourage one another as Christians even. If you think of the New Testament, think of verses like Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, 
where we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, in verse 19 says, addressing one another. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our hearts. This is something we can do. We can engage one another in the worship of our God. More people need to be brought into this, including in our own church. Psalm 34, verse 3, of course, the whole book of Psalms showing a, a picture of worship for us. But Psalm 34, verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Let's do that together. And so this, that's a summons of worship, a summons to sing, as we've seen in the beginning of this song. That it is a, a, a command to bring people together to come and worship our God for who he is and what he's done. In fact, we could even say this is how we tell the world about our great God, too. It's not just for, for oh, other Christians in the church to know of God's greatness. This is for everyone, every person to hear. We rejoice to speak and sing of our God to those who are yet to come to faith in Christ. Why be shy? Oh, I, I won't speak of God if, if that's not your thing. I, I won't talk about it. Then. Well, like, Jesus is only amazing as long as you think he's amazing? No, he is incredible and amazing because he died and rose again, and I don't care who you are, you need to hear that. That's incredible. No one can live up to that. It's even been said in this world where we live, where we know we are at odds because there's this reality of spiritual warfare that we are living in, it has been said that worship is warfare. Worship is warfare. In the proclamation of God's character and his ways, the world is confronted with the truth about Jesus. They need to hear. They need to know that we truly do have the one true God and we know his son, Jesus Christ. As Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have something to say, don't you? You have something to sing about. You have something to declare. You have something to talk about that's of substance because it's changed your life. It's transformed you. It's altered your, your very trajectory away from bound for hell towards heaven and new life in Christ and eternity with him. We can speak. This is a part of what worship is. We, we rally together and we, and we gain more people to come and know and sing and praise our great God. Let's keep going in our text and we come to point two that we find, and this is in verses 11 through 22. We see the summary, the summary of the battle. The summary of the battle. This is where we're going to find some, some recounting and repeating somewhat of what we've already covered in chapter 4, but yet with some different details and obviously a different perspective on it. But let's look at the summary of the battle in this song of worship and praise to God. Verse 11, kind of again there at the end of the verse. Then down to the gates marched the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, break out in a song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinom. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, their root, the root they, they marched down to into the valley, following you. Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Machir, marched down the commanders. And from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came with Deborah, and Issachar, faithful to Barak. Into the valley, they rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there was great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of the heart. Gilead stayed behind beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risk their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came. They fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan. At Ta'anak, by the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with galloping, a galloping of his steeds. So we begin here with a, a summary statement of our section. That's really found at the end of verse 11, what started it all. Then down to the gates march the people of the Lord. And into the battle we go. God's people responded and marched into a battle where God would make them victorious. And so the song goes on to describe this in more detail. What did this battle look like? How did it go down? What happened? Well, first, the, the leaders respond to the call. 
In verse 12, Deborah responds and Barak responds. Both of them are mentioned in this verse, and they're both instrumental in leading God's people in the battle, as we know from Judges 4. Regardless, they, they responded both in assembling people for battle and engaging in the battle. And praise God for victory in the battle. Second, several tribes and people respond to the call in verses 13 to 15. We see that we have multiple tribes that are mentioned here. We'll we are told of more people and tribes that actually joined than we're told back in chapter 4. Back in chapter 4, we were made aware of Zebulun and Naphtali, but that was it. And here we are recognizing there, there's more that was going on in the assembling of the 10,000 troops that were brought together by Barak. We learn of Ephraim marching down into the valley. And Deborah was from Ephraim, so they were attached to this, I'm sure. Benjamin joined as well as Machir, which was a reference to the half-tribe of Manasseh that was west of the Jordan River. Of course, Zebulun and Issachar are responsive to the call, as we already know from chapter 4. And they went with Deborah and Barak. They were faithful to Barak and rushed down into the valley of Sisera and his chariots following closely behind Barak. As we mentioned last time, Barak was the one that was potentially shaking in his boots when Deborah said, Up, go, God goes before you, go into battle. Well, think of how all the army behind him felt. Really? I mean, I feel really safe on this mountaintop. I mean, remember, you see the horses and the chariots down there? I'm not looking forward to that. Can we stay up here? Can we start making some bows and arrows or something like that? Maybe I can throw my spear that far. I don't know. Do we have to go down? And so this is a praise that not only Barak went and made the charge, but they, these tribes that joined in the battle, were faithful and went with him that closely behind his heels. But we also noticed that certain tribes and people refused the call. There were certain tribes that decided, no, that's okay. Not for us. We see the, the tribe of Reuben and, and Gilead, which is the, probably the, the half-tribe. There's Gad and then the half-tribe of Manasseh. That was on the other side of the Jordan. And the tribe of Dan and, and Asher. And we're told of multiple tribes that refused to join and assemble for battle against the Canaanites. Reuben especially says they, they like staying comfortable with the sheep. They like their pastoral duties and they said, we're just going to stay here. Though, there may have been great searchings of the heart, as our text says, there was no response from the people of Reuben. You can almost picture them going, oh really? Some of our fellow Israelites are going into battle? Hmm. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Great searchings of my heart. Yeah, I'm really going to search my heart on this one. And do nothing. And sit with the sheep. And Gilead beyond the Jordan, like Reuben stayed east of the Jordan. Dan chose to stay in the coast by the ships. Asher, too, stayed at the coast of the sea. None of these tribes responded, showing the obvious breakdown from the time of Joshua. Back in the time of Joshua, it was a different story. In fact, they actually made covenants among each other. Those tribes that were on the, the, east of the, the east and the west of the Jordan River decided, if you're going to battle, we cross the river and we come to help. And likewise for you, we will come and we will be a part of actually gaining this land and we will not let the Jordan River be a divide between us. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's too inconvenient. You know, I, I kind of like, I have, I have my, my pasture here, I have my sheep here. Ah, you know, good luck. A verse or two that described them winning the battle. And actually, no man being left except for Sisera, who ran away on foot. But here we get a little more details of the battle than we did in chapter 4. When the battle lines were drawn and the, the fighting took place between the Israelites and the Canaanites, Deborah and Barak note that the Canaanites got no spoils of silver. I mean, the reality is, if you had to put odds as you go into this, you're kind of saying, I'm going to put my money on the Canaanites, the guys with the horses and the chariots. I'm going to put my money on them. I think they're probably going to win this battle. I mean, they have a rich history of just destroying people here in the north, and they have dominated this land for some time. Sisera is a ruthless commander. I'm pretty sure they're going to win again. Who are these no-name Israelites that are trying to band together? Yeah, the chariots got this one in the back. But what happens? Despite all their time for, for Sisera and his chariots, what should have been a textbook victory of them going and gathering their spoils and continuing to mass up all of what they have accumulated through their evil ways of dominating people, we see it's an upset. And how? How is such an upset possible as we saw in chapter 4? This is where we get even more information on the battle. In verses 20 and 21, we get the explanation that heaven fought against Sisera and the Canaanites. The stars could be a reference to the heavenly host of angel armies, God's angels, fighting for God's people. How so? How exactly were they fighting for God's people against Sisera? Well, verse 21 gives us a picture. It says that the torrent Kishon swept them away. God showed up to the battle with much rain and water. 
That's what God did. He poured out from the heavens an unexpected flood of rain. And this rain caused a small little brook, the Kishon. No one would have thought twice about it. Okay, a tiny brook. What's the big deal? This small little brook, the Kishon, overflowed and became the very demise and downfall for Sisera and all these chariots. This brook became the torrent that swept them away. And so verse 22 describes the panic and the difficulty of Sisera's army through the, the loud galloping of the horses, the, the panic, you can hear it, the panic of these horses in this flood scene that came upon them. They were caught off guard by the supernatural intervention of Yahweh, and they suffered the defeat. And so we learn more. That's what the battle looked like. It truly was God going before them, and it truly was God delivering the victory. So how does this summary of the battle inform our understanding of worship? Again, this is a song of worship and praise for God's people to continue to study and model and emulate. How does this help us? Well, we're called to keep our worship fixated upon God, who he is, and what he has done. And while God delights to work through imperfect people, he is the one that we praise. The Israelites were not to praise the leaders. They were not to praise the tribes, the people that showed up, or even the torrential downpour. They don't praise the clouds. They don't praise the rain. They don't praise the people involved. The Israelites were to praise the one over all those things, Yahweh. Yahweh alone must be worshipped for calling his people into battle and winning the battle through his mighty works. So our worship must point to the God who is working in the church and the one who is above the church. We worship God alone because he's calling people to himself through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We worship God alone because he's working in us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We worship God for all that he has done for us in salvation that we know. And we worship God for all that he continues to do for us every single day. True worship is aimed at worshiping God in all things. In all things. We can look at any pocket, any area of our life, and we can ascribe glory and praise to God. And if you think I can't do that, then you're not looking hard enough. You don't have an accurate understanding of just how great your God is and just how much he is doing. You need to grow in that and have a better appreciation that your God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. That man may make his plans, but God is the one who ultimately makes the call and directs the steps. You need to have this view of your God. That he's working everything according to the counsel of his will. You need to have this view of your God that he loves and he delights to not just do things for his glory, but for your good. You need to have this view of your God that, that he is taking you and he's pushing you and just allowing you to grow and grow and become more mature and more sanctified. And that is how much he is working in every detail of your life. If you have a low view of God, why would you worship him? But if you start to understand just how involved he is in your one life... And just how much he's done in the past up to this moment and how much he has in store for you all for your good and his glory, if you get a better grasp of that, you have one response. God, you are great. Your, your greatness is unsearchable. I can't even fathom all that you have done in my life that I don't even recognize. And I'm going to get to heaven and see it then and just give you an ounce of the worship that you deserve. We will come to the conclusion as the psalmist in Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Well, let's hasten to the end of this song. And that's point three in our notes this morning. The statement of the blessed and the cursed. The statement of the blessed and the cursed. So we come to a wrap-up of this. Or there's still, the battle is done, but there's still more to be focused upon and more to be taken away. Look at verse 23. Curse Moroz, says the angel of the Lord, curse its inhabitants thoroughly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of ten dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet, he sank, he fell. And where he sank, there he fell, dead. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? 
her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb for, for, or two for every man? Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera? Spoil of dyed materials embroidered? Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as spoil? So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Our text ends with a back and forth between cursing and blessing and final reflections upon that battle between the Israelites and the Canaanites. First, there's a curse for Moroz. A curse for Moroz in verse 23. And this might seem a bit odd. Curse Moroz, says the angel of the Lord, curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And this might strike you as odd. Okay, who's Moroz? What is this? We don't really know. It's like mentioned here and nowhere else. And we're going, okay, uh, we don't know much about this. And, and so commentators basically conclude it's probably a nearby town to this battle. Probably a town that was close in proximity to this location, to this battle. And what did they do? They probably chose not to engage. Reuben, you can maybe understand because they're on the other side of the Jordan River, far away. But a town that's right there and they choose to not engage at all. Why are they not simply called out like the other tribes previously mentioned who didn't show up to fight? Well, we notice that the angel of the Lord, who's uttering the curse upon this town, Moroz, and perhaps this nearby Israelite town directly disobeyed the instructions of God's messenger to engage in the battle and to push out the Canaanites. And so what did they do? They knew well the information, they knew well the call, and they knew well their rejection of it. And so in rejecting God's command through his messenger, they proved themselves to be disobedient Israelites that were in close proximity to this event. And they are cursed for rejecting God and deliberately disobeying in a, such a crucial time as this. Ironically, there is blessing that does flow right after this to someone else that's near in proximity. But this someone else isn't even an Israelite. So maybe some of the Israelites that were close in proximity get cursed because they did not engage. But the non-Israelites that, that were close in proximity did engage. And what do they get? blessing. This is what we find. There's, there's blessing for Jael in verses 24 to 27. Verses 24 to 27, there's blessing for Jael, this woman that took Sisera's life. Now this is the climactic ending to our story in chapter 4, as you remember, and now here, poetically delivered. Verse 24 identifies Jael as the woman to be blessed. She was the wife of Heber the Kenite, and she successfully got Sisera to turn aside into her tent and to lie down when he was fleeing the battle. And verse 25 recalls the way that she took care of him. She gave him milk, or more specifically, yogurt, basically, and tried to hide him and put him under a rug. Verse 26 and 27 state in vivid imagery the death of Sisera and the final blow of the enemy from chapter 4. And we just feel the song slow down and zoom in on this moment with the way that it's described. She sent her hand to the tempe and her right hand to the workman's mallet, and you just see it slowing down in your head. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. How many more words do you need? Right. She really let him have it, okay? The repetition of the verse 27 would have us to fixate on this outcome. This is amazing that this is exactly happening like God said, that this downfall of this amazingly renowned commander that was known for all of his evil ways is going to happen by the hand of a woman. And sure enough, verse 27 has to repeat that to make sure we catch it. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Exactly as God said. For this non-Israelite woman to act with such courage and strike down this commander was a most surprising element of the story. And of course, this was how God was to receive glory in all these events. Regardless, Jael is remembered as a blessed woman for her actions. She's re recounted as a, as a blessed woman for these actions. We move on and we see that there is a curse then, a curse that comes for Sisera's mom. As odd as this might seem, verses 28 through 30, a curse for Sisera's mom. And we get this more than likely hypothetical scene that comes here. Was any Israelite actually there in, in the Canaanite land to see what Sisera's mom was doing? Was this actual, was someone actually there and saying, oh yeah, I remember when she was looking and waiting and she was wondering when her son was gonna get back. It's possibly that it's just more of this, this imagination that's happening here, and yet it proves the point, though, that I think Deborah and Barak are making. In the most interesting way, they're, they're highlighting the curse that exists for God's enemies. That's the point. 
For the enemies of God, this is what they have in store. The song accomplishes by contemplating Sisera's mother. And, and see, it's a worried mom, you can picture this, a worried mom wondering when her child's going to return. And the tragedy lies in the fact that he's not coming back. He will not be returning as he normally does. And there's an attempt to seek consolation in the fact that they're running late, you know, because there's so much spoil and there's so much stuff that they're getting. They'll be here, they'll be here, it's fine. And on the one hand, this may seem somewhat sweet and innocent, like, oh, she just wants to see her baby boy. She's just a worried mom. She wants to see her son. However, in this case, her son is a commander of a pagan army that murders and steals from people. Now, let's just make sure that's clear. This has been his... And Yahweh has done what is good in this situation. How do we know that? Well, consider how our text ends. Finally, consider the bottom line of the cursing and the blessing in verse 31. The bottom line of this cursing and blessing in verse 31. So may all your enemies perish... O oh Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his, mid, in his might, and the land had rest for 40 years. The song concludes with a strong return to the focus on where it needs to be all along, the Lord. Because if you think of this entire third section, you might be thinking, huh, now it's like it's, there are rewards going to just people. You know, there's, there's people getting recognized for their disobedience, there's people getting recognized for their obedience, and, and it's, it does seem like the focus is almost going to people now. Is that what's going on? What's the point of this? What's the point of highlighting the faithful and the unfaithful? What's the point of highlighting those that are blessed and those that are cursed? The song has shown that such blessed or cursed positions arise based upon one's position to Yahweh. This is based upon how they have positioned themselves in regard to Yahweh. For those that are enemies of Yahweh, there's just one position that they get, one result, curse. Jabin is cursed in annihilation. Sisera is cursed in humiliation. Moroz is cursed in disobedient dishonor. Those who are against Yahweh will be under a curse. And furthermore, for much of the Old Testament, we see that those who are against God's people are in fact against Yahweh. And what happens with them? They are in fact cursed. This goes back to what God himself told Abraham. In Genesis 12, when he called Abraham, in Genesis 12, 3, he said, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. On the other hand, those that are friends of Yahweh, they're in the position of blessing. The ESV uses the wording of friend, but other translations state more specifically and more accurately, those who love him. The friends of Yahweh are the ones that love Yahweh. Those that love Yahweh will be blessed by God. Deborah and Barak were blessed for obeying God. The faithful tribes were blessed for joining the battle. Jael, the non-Israelite woman, was blessed for destroying the enemy of God. These are the options. And so what does it ultimately come back to? It comes back to God. It comes back to Yahweh. We're not praising these people for what they've done. We're praising God who actually lavishes blessing upon those that love him and curse upon those that hate him and disobey. What does this have to do with worship? Well, often people think that they can live however they want and ask God to bless their life. You talk about the, the concept of blessing. What a mixed concept. What a concept that people have all kinds of thoughts on when it comes to blessing. And so people want to live however they live, but then they can say, Hey, God, just bless my life. Bless my plans. Bless my intentions. Bless the way I'm living. Bless everything about me that I've decided already that I don't want you to say anything about. But just bless it, please. Make it better. That's not how worship works. That's not worship. That's genie talk, isn't it? God, give me what I want. Hey, I'm talking to you, so give me points for that, and then bless me for, for everything else that I have planned in front of me. Make it go well. Be my good luck charm. Please, make it just be a good week for me. That's not worship, and that's not who Yahweh is. We must come to God and love God on his terms, on his terms and what he says. So the blessing of eternal life comes when we surrender ourselves and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then you get blessing. You have come to God on his terms. You've surrendered yourself and said, I can't do this. I need forgiveness, and only your son can give me that. Please forgive me. Ah, now you're approaching God on his terms. And you'll get blessing. Eternal life. The blessing of peace comes when we trust God with our lives. When we actually can say that and say, Lord, I, I know this situation is something I have my fingers wrapped tightly around because I really want it to go a certain way. And I want it to be better, and I want it to be better now. But God, I come to you, and I say, it's your situation. What do I know? 
You're the one that's already dictated all this. You're the one that knows exactly what this is doing. And if I'm struggling with it, it's because I'm trying to be you. God, I step back and I, I, I lift it up to you. You do with this what you want. Now you've surrendered. Now you're coming to him on his terms. No more genie talk, but letting God be God. Letting Yahweh be and do what Yahweh does best. And what happens to you? You get blessing from that. He does, in fact, give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. He does, in fact, bless in that situation. This is worship. Not our call. God's. We come to him on his terms, as this is shown us in the text. So worship requires us knowing God. We need to know who God is and, and what he has done. For them, it was, it was one massive event that they saw clearly, and they were able to respond immediately and say, this is all about Yahweh. Tell everyone what just happened. Everyone needs to know how great our God is. And this is true worship. You and I, getting ourselves right back into the nose of Scripture, getting ourselves right back into all of who our God is and what he's done, and then lifting up and saying, who can I tell? Everyone needs to know how amazing this God is. And we get right back into it again, and we continue to see all of who he is, and we know him more, and we recognize what he does in his amazing ways that are beyond our comprehension, and then we open our mouth. We encourage one another in the church. We speak to this world that knows nothing of Christ, and we tell them about our amazing God and Savior. That's worship. Not you flipping it around and saying, God, I want to worship you in this way. I think that's okay. But you're letting God be God, and then you're responding in worship to him. When we worship God for who he is and what he's done, then, then we'll be blessed. Then we'll be blessed. Not when we tell God what to do for us. That's not blessing. If we shape God to fit our design and preferences, we will not be blessed. Rather, we run the risk of being cursed. We run the risk of getting frustrated that God's not doing what we want. And then we run the risk of staying our course and, and doubling down on our efforts, even though God has a better plan that is according to his will. And we run the risk of going against him and being opposed to him. We've learned about worship this morning. Worship is, in church services and in the entirety of our life, it's about offering ourselves to him as living sacrifices. It's letting God be God. Reflecting on who he is and what he's done and making sure that that is what's driving everything. That, that has to be what drives you. What gets you up in the morning and pushes you into your day is not a look at yourself. It's not a look at your circumstances. What pushes you in your day and allows you to get through and to move through with success and faithfulness because you've looked at God. And you've looked at God for so long that you've said, this life is amazing that he's given me to live. I cannot wait to go out and live it for him. Now you're a worshiper. And you're not worshiping yourself. You're worshiping God. You're letting him be God. And his amazing ways dictate your life. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we know that we, we all have our struggles with death grips on things in our life that we want to hold on to and we want to dictate and we want to decide what is best. But God, we know that that's not worship. God, forgive us. Forgive us for such selfishness. Forgive us for pride. Forgive us for times where, where we really want to limit you and we want to tell you how things ought to go. God, forgive us for these times. Instead, Lord, let us come to you surrender. In view of your mercies, in view of all that you've done, in view of all of who you are, let us come in humility before you. And as we gain the greater and greater confidence of who you are and your faithfulness and how you've proven yourself over and over again in the word and in our own lives that we respond in true worship, ready to do all that you call us to do, ready to trust you, ready to keep talking to you in prayer, ready to depend upon you. God, let everyone at MCC be a true worshiper, not of self, but unlike the world, that we would worship the God who is far above us and knows way more than us. We praise you and we bless you, God, because you are incredible. I pray this in your name.